My name is Alex Salkiever. I'm the moderator of this panel. Uh, I wrote a book last year called The Driver in the Driverless Car, How Our Technology Choices Can Change the Future. And part of what I wrote about in that book was fourth industrial age uh, technologies. Um, and when we talk about fourth industrial age, we're talking about uh, something that will completely change the way goods are produced in the world today. And it's happening now, and it will accelerate over the next 10, 20 years. And the people on this panel here are all involved in fourth industrial age companies or policy. And so what we're going to talk about now is what they see happening, what the fourth industrial age means, and how entrepreneurs can think about this and potentially contribute to the fourth industrial age. Uh, so the way I wanted to run the panel is I'm going to have each of the panelists introduce themselves quickly, explain what they do and their involvement in the fourth industrial age, and then we're going to have some questions that I'm going to give to each panelist so that they can uh, give their thoughts. At the very end of the discussion, we'll probably open the floor to some questions so that you all can ask a few questions. Uh, so to get started quickly, uh, if each of the panelists starting from my right with Tanya Woods could give a quick introduction of who they are, their company, and their vision or what they, their involvement with the fourth industrial age. Hi everybody, it's nice to see you this morning so early and fresh. Um, I'm Tanya Woods, I'm the Managing Director for Gen Canada, um, but I've also spent uh, over a decade and a half now working at the edge of technology and policy shifts. Um, I've advised multinational video game companies for the last four years um, on how to think through their technologies um, with respect to policy issues and legal issues around the world, um, but also especially in Canada. Um, I have also uh, am a founder of a company that's embedding blockchain, AI, and a number of other edge technologies um, in the social context. So I have a lot of familiarity with some of the challenges. I will not give you all the answers. I don't have them, um, but I'm looking forward to the talk today. I need to open it? Okay. Yeah, I think you're on. All right. Yeah. My name is Utku Pazar. I'm head of strategy and business development at Coach Holding. Uh, I see many familiar faces, so I'm assuming you are familiar with Coach Holding. For, but for our international guests, Coach Holding is the largest industrial conglomerate in Turkey with over $50 billion uh, of revenues, and we represent 10% of Turkey's uh, exports. And we are a mainly an industrial conglomerate, so fourth industrial revolution is uh, of very uh, significant importance for us. Uh, in my current role, I'm also uh, on top of uh, normal duties of strategy and business development. Uh, I'm leading the digital transformation program at Coach Holding. Therefore, um, we are um, looking at all the disruption and the trends that are associated with the fourth industrial revolution. Some call it digital transformation. Uh, and we are trying to find strategies that will enable our companies to be competitive going forward as well. My name is Amitabh Kant. I'm the CEO of uh, the National Institution for Transforming India. It's called the Niti Aayog. Uh, my job is to drive innovation, entrepreneurship, and startups in India. I was earlier secretary of the Department of Industrial Policy and Promotion. We, my job was to drive foreign direct investment in India, work with private sector to enhance India's competitiveness, and ensure that in India becomes a great manufacturing base. Good morning, everyone. I'm Murat Arjan from Kortsa. Uh, Kortsa is the worldwide leader for uh, reinforcement materials in uh, especially tire, tires. So in uh, every car that you drive, one out of every three tire has Kortsa's reinforcement materials. When you fly, uh, two out of every three airplane tires have Kortsa's material in them, reinforcement materials. Quartz is trying to transition itself to uh, trying to become reinforcing the life, so bringing new concepts like composites, reinforcements, and construction reinforcements into the field. And we're trying to grow and learn together uh, with our community and society. And my role is uh, to, I'm responsible from uh, the organic and the inorganic growth of the company. So you can see we have a really diverse panel of people across industries and across the world. Um, and 
I'm sure each of them has a little different view of what the fourth industrial revolution means in their realm. And so that's the next question I wanted to ask, starting with Tanya. When you say the words fourth industrial Re revolution, what does that mean? <laughs> there's a whole book yes, I encourage there's you to a whole read. Book. <laughs> <laughs> so if you haven't read it, it's by Klaus Schwab, and I'm going to defer the definition to that book. Um, it's a great book to start, but um, I don't, I don't necessarily want to put a band around it, and I know I'm totally diverting answering this directly, well, but good. I think there's characteristics that define it. Um, because in truth, we don't really know what it means. It's not really clear what it is. We know things about it. And so um, I would say the velocity or the speed with which disruption is happening, innovation is happening, the convergence aspect uh, across sectors, across technologies, it's no longer a piece of innovation or a type of innovation or a technology for a purpose. It's thinking through every single purpose. It's thinking about purposes that were never intended. Um, I think those are very important. And then there's just the profound novelty that comes. So when you find, for example, um, a technology that maybe Murat has invested in that then has applicability in fashion or in dairy or in, um, well, automotive's obvious, so we've got to find more non-obvious ones, but anyway, you can imagine with him. I'm not the chief imaginator right now. But, um, but there's profound novelty in everything that we're seeing because of the convergence. So I think these are the core characteristics. Um, and, and then for me, the fourth is around humanity, and it's a big question mark, so we'll come back to it, I'm sure. Um, so, so I'll make this slightly more specific. You're going uh, to have you know, <laughs> for, for Coach Holdings, when you think fourth industrial revolution, what does that mean? I think um, a lot can be said about Ford Industrial Revolution. Klaus Schwab uh, has coined the term, and um, some of the topics are synonymous with what they call digital transformation or digital disruption. But for me, Ford Industrial Revolution is all about disruption. What I mean by disruption is that um, we're living in an era where the change and, and the speed of change has accelerated. Um, just to give you an example, let's go back to, I see uh, a lot of early 20s uh, audience here, uh, when you were starting your first education, pretty much majority of the services and products that you do use didn't exist. I'm just going to name a few. In year 2005, there was no iPhone. There was no Facebook. There was no Instagram. There was no Spotify. There was no Uber. There was no Airbnb. There was no Bitcoin. They all happened in the last decade. So for me, fourth industry revolution is, you know, Topic is quite broad. Everybody, you know, Bitcoin, sorry, blockchain, uh, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. There are a lot of underlying technology that some call it. There are 11 technologies that drive this change. But all in all, combined with the pace and combined with the multidisciplinary impact of these, we'll see a lot of disruption in all the value chains, and nobody or no industry actually will stay untouched. That's how I feel. Uh, about Ford Industrial Revolution. That's why it's very important that everyone, including the large companies, SMEs, governments, regulators, citizens, needs to really understand what's going on. However, it's really hard. You know, when you're living in the change, you see things happening slowly, but it's easy to look back 100 years from now and say, wow, what, ha what has happened? Or talking about the uh, early, uh, you know, days of internet, it's really easy to talk about the history, but it's really hard to predict the future. Uh, but as a, um, as a person, as a citizen, and, and as a businessman, I see the pace of innovation and pace of change has drastically increased. And uh, that's what I think everybody needs to understand and, and plan accordingly. Uh, so, Mr. Khan, maybe some specific examples. Because, uh, I mean, I know India, uh, primarily known in the past much more for information technology companies, uh, but I know there's a big push into more industrial production. Um, how has how do you think now about uh, fourth industrial revolution with the context of you, you know what you're seeing in that shift? Well, for me, uh, the fourth industrial revolution is about the digitization of the manufacturing process uh, because earlier you we used to have the manufacturer. There was a separate consumer, and to reach the consumer, there was distribution, there was retail. All that has converged, all that has integrated on a real-time basis. And that has been made possible because you've had the development of very vast computational resources. 
you've had new algorithms, and you have the availability of big data related to the Internet of Things. And all that enables you to link up the ultimate consumer, the distributor, the retailer, and knock out those chains to the manufacturing place. And actually, uh, the manufacturing, which used to be very earlier known as dark, dirty, and dangerous, has become very fashionable and very sexy. So if you go to a, today a fourth industrial generation uh, factory today, if you were to go to, tomorrow to the GE factory in Pune in India, uh, in Maharashtra, it's a very, very fashionable factory. I mean, it's, it's a digital manufacturing. It's the increased uh, digitization of the manufacturing process with the chief executive sitting on the floor space. And therefore, to my mind, uh, what is going to happen is that increasingly uh, the consumer, the distribution, the retail, and the manufacturing will all be working on real-time basis. And depending on what the consumer wants, the manufacturing will take place on that basis. So everything will be collapsed, time-wise, demand, design. Uh, talk in, in, in the next round, maybe, or actually, Murat, you can actually probably talk about this a little bit because I know Quartza is doing this. I mean, how has the fourth industrial revolution at Quartza collapsed all of the time scales and the, uh, the, the middle cycles that took before? Uh, Alex, I was just thinking about 22 years ago when I started working in my first job uh, in an automotive, very, very, very well-known automotive uh, company in Turkey. We had to wait for a month, and after the month, a week, to have our metrics, operational metrics, to be sent over to us so that we would see what kind of operational uh, outputs we would have so that we could try to improve ourselves. So imagine that it is a five-week journey. You have to go through, and then you receive some results, and with that, you try to you know, improve what you're doing. And today at Corsa, on my mobile, I can see whatever machine today is producing what and at what original equipment efficiency is working just on my mobile just now. So this is the power of big data. This is the power of machine learning. And this is a lot of power. Now, what does court do with this power? Now, if we can have that, we try to concentrate more on how do we understand the world's challenges? How do we understand the customer's needs? So we focus more on customer side and the innovation of that. Because on the other side, what Industry 4.0 brings to Quartza together with all uh, the capabilities that it has is being able to create uh, our next big things about our technologies, about our engineering capabilities, about innovation, and about really open innovation understanding really how we create an open innovation ecosystem uh, within <coughs> our industry. And, and so that's a theme that I actually didn't have uh, in the questions for the panelists, but usually when I run panels, I confuse the panelists. That's part of my job. So um, open innovation is actually a fascinating topic. Um, and I'd love for you each to talk about how that's impacting uh, the way that you're working right now with uh, industrial production, fourth industrial age. For the audience, uh, open innovation means, um, at least to my mind, the idea that in the past you had a few scientists in a lab and they didn't talk to anybody and they maybe built some things together, whereas to today it's much more collaborative. Uh, very often the things that they're building, they're sharing the intellectual property across broad groups. Um, and the production itself may result in things that are actually shared uh, across even companies, where different companies will produce the same product, but they all benefited from p parts of it. So, and Tanya, I know in, in Canada there's a there's quite a bit of this. I'm I'm very familiar yeah. with it. Yeah. So our government um, has really been great to champion to champion open innovation and support um, for a, a diverse group of entrepreneurs uh, and individuals. There's some themes that they've really pulled forward. Open innovation being one. The other being. Um, we have a, a feminist prime minister, so diversity and gender parity, um, and also skills uh, enabling and capacity building. And, and the reason why I'm sharing the three with you is because they converge in government labs. So the government departments are now setting up innovation labs where they invite entrepreneurs to come, businesses to come, academics to come, and they all work together um, to improve 
whichever project is there um, and being supported through government funding or government initiatives. So we're seeing all kinds of ecosystems develop now inside universities where they're drawing people from outside in to help um, the academics and whatnot to grow their projects and their IP and scale it outside the institutions. We're seeing it um, with startups even like my own um, where we get to go engage with the policymakers right at the beginning. And the value for everybody is that we learn what they're thinking about and what they worry about, which will ultimately be regulation that at some stage will actually govern what we're doing, but they also learn how we're doing things, and so they're not so quick to be fearful and then put harsh regulation in place that could stifle the innovation. So um, I think that's, that's probably a good bit of insight. So, so inside of Coach Holdings, since you're running digital transformation there, can you give me a couple of examples of uh, open innovation projects or projects where you collaborated broadly outside of the company to do interesting things? Okay. I think, let me first start by uh, explaining how we look at digital transformation program because yes. open innovation is, is a core uh, aspect of it, but without really understanding the entire holistic view, it's really um, not full-fledged explanation. So from our perspective, we have 24 portfolio companies and each of them are different. Uh, let's say, let's take as an example, Tuprash, it's Turkey's only refinery. The, the refining business is very different than what AutoCoach is doing, like auto retail, for example. So from our perspective, you need to first start by doing a long-term view of what should be your company's strategy. What is it that is going on in your sector and around your sector that will impact you five years, 10 years down the line? And having the strategic vision and aligning your priorities is number one. And this gives you an overview, an idea about where you want to go and what you need to do. This is relatively the easy part because you know uh, um, it's easy to really know your business and what might happen and try to position yourself as a uh, exercise, but it's really hard to get it done. And the reason for that is, I always give this example, when you are 20, 60 years old, it's really hard to learn gymnastics. So most of the companies are aged, and the new era requires new skills, new flexibility, new thinking that doesn't necessarily foster in established organization. That's why the uh, being able to tap into external capability, I call it, is very, very critical. Therefore, as part of actually as an intersection at Coach Holding, we have an innovation program where we are um, trying to first foster internal innovation because this is required for an organization to be absorbent of new ideas. Once you get that working and once you have that framework functioning, then the next step is to open up because first you make your people absorbent and receptive to new ideas and you experiment a little bit, you do a little bit of risk-taking culture, a little bit of accepting a failure culture, and then you start collaborating. This year, in 2008, because we started this digital transformation program two years ago, we have all the roadmaps on the companies and they are doing what they are supposed to do in their own territory, but this year our priority is open innovation. And for that, we discuss with uh, all our company digital transformation leaders to uh, really get two key examples. One was work with a startup, Definitely plug yourself into an ecosystem. And the second one is work with another company. These are easier said than done. Uh, to foster that, you also need a mechanism and a place to make it happen. In Turkey, you see more and more uh, co-working spaces uh, coming up. We have K-Works as under the Koch University to foster, uh, it works as an incubator slash accelerator. We are encouraging all our companies to do their um, structured open innovation program either through KWORKS or other ones. To just give maybe a couple of examples is uh, the, the fascinating ideas come from multidisciplinary discussions. So everybody talks about connected cars, everybody talks about connected uh, or smart home. But when you combine these two, and maybe a little bit of banking into it, 
then you unleash a real, a real consumer journey where a company would not be able to do on its own. Therefore, I can't name because it's a, it's a project that is still ongoing, but you will see all these connected products that you touch during most of your day will be able to talk to each other in, in within this year from our uh, portfolio company's perspective. Oh, that's super interesting. And, and when you're talking about connected cars, connected vehicles, that's also IoT, so it feeds back into production and all of the things you're learning about the customers. Mr. Kant, um, I know India has benefited tremendously from open innovation because of the free flow of ideas between many of the Indians working abroad who then come back or many of the multinationals that work there. In fact, on, I was judging at the Startup Istanbul contest and one of the startups was a company that had engineers who had worked at Amazon in Seattle then gone back to India. How is this playing out in open innovation in the fourth industrial age? Uh, so, you know, the Western world has always innovated. And uh, it has innovated for arms, it has innovated for weapons, it has innovated for driverless cars. And uh, since you're an author of a very distinguished book, I mean, these are challenges which are fairly irrelevant for most countries across the world. <laughs> I mean, whether you have a driverless cars or not is not relevant for India or for Turkey. I mean, the challenges here relate to whether we have drinking water which is fluoride and arsenic free, whether our farmers are able to get seed and fertilizer depending on weather and soil conditions, and uh, whether we are able to convert our waste into energy or whether we can uh, do our const construction 10x faster. Uh, so, you know, the Silicon Valley has all the innovators, but it has no challenges. The, the challenges are all in developing world. And therefore, uh, what the fourth, the digitization process and the fourth industrial revolution does is to enable the rest of the world to use digital technology to catch up with the rest of the world and to leapfrog technologically, which is what we are doing in terms of uh, digitization using biometric. Every Indian has a biometric. We have a billion biometric. We have a You're billion. talking about the ARDA program. Yeah, we yeah. have a billion biometric. We have a billion mobile. We have a billion bank accounts. And everything is interlinked with biometrics. So I can do a biometric to biometric transfer. But more important than that is that, I mean, look at the kind of innovations. We've had one young girl uh, doing Hello English a digital technology platform to teach nine million Indians how to speak English. No school, no college has been able to do this. Or Mitra Biotech, you know, three and a half years back, many of our startups used to go to Silicon Valley. We've now been able to create an ecosystem where many of them relocate to Bangalore and Hyderabad. So Mitra Biotech has innovated using digital platforms to do personalized cancer care across. And that's a unique innovation or consumer medical. And I, w I was not aware that actually in the world, 100 million people actually suffer from stool management issues, 16 million in India, and they innovated an adapter, which they penetrated the world with that, and which has enabled the world to find a very quick, fast digital solution to issues of stool management. And therefore, what the fourth industrial revolution cuts across industry, it cuts across the services sector. The availability of data enables you to do innovation which is relevant for the developing world. And therefore, it provides a solution to enhance production, productivity, lower cost, and make a quantum jump in terms of technology, and use technology to leapfrog in many, many ways, uh, which the world had never seen in the past. So Murat, you had, all, you had given me a little bit of insight earlier about the program that you're running with the, uh, the self-contained uh, manufacturing, research, everything located in one place, and you're also collaborating with Savancha University, and I assume with universities in other parts of the world as well. Uh, tell me a little bit about how the open innovation process and fourth industrial age, because they are closely linked, works in your environment to uh, make new products and bring them to market faster, and anything specific would be great. Sure. So the first thing is, what I believe as open innovation is, is really building trust. You need to build trust 
within your own ecosystem. So in, with your stakeholders, each and every one of them, you need to build trust. If you have trust then and the ecosystem, then you could have open innovation. Just think about you having um, one technology that nobody has. It's unique. And could you really give up this and share it with everybody, knowing that it's going to come back to you in multiples? This is a mindset change. Okay, so we don't act in that manner. What we say is that if we have something unique, we try to make the maximum out of that. Actually, this is not valid for today's work. What you need to do is you need to give it, you need to share it, because what comes with that is really maybe 3x, maybe 10x. We have to believe in trusting in our ecosystems. In that, we have to build our ecosystems. and. Uh, for Quartza, what we try to do is we have built um, Composite Technology Center of Excellence. It's just one building in Technopark Istanbul in which on the main floor we have production of composite materials, prepregs. On the second floor we have university students, labs, and 3D printing additive manufacturing equipment so that students can make parts with that. And then on the third floor we have PhDs, university students, and professors, and on the fourth floor is Quartz's headquarters. So all of us dine together, people with ties, you can see them, people with barely shorts, you can see them. We are all together working uh, in a techno park, which belongs to the government, and trying to create value together. So I think that if you have that, I would give a specific example, Alex, as you said it, uh, is that, and this is going to touch to what Tanya was saying, as human aspect of the uh, issue is also important uh, here, is that, for example, 10 years ago, Corsa com comes up with a um, technology which says, okay, there is resource in all formaldehyde used in our production processes, all right, in our dipping materials. So what if we made sure that this is not being used? This is a 90-year-old technology that is being used. What if we were to change that with something else, okay, that is risk-free, that is better for humans, that's for the operators and uh, for everybody. So it took us nine years to create that into a project and an IP and some technology. So what did we do with that? Rather than trying to commercialize it, we opened that to one of our customers and said that we want to do this an open innovation platform. And we said, without us, this cannot happen. Without you, as our uh, main customer, this is not going to happen. So with them together, we decided to open the, all the IPs that we have created so far after the results that we have achieved, knowing that RF-free products are available in our world, uh, which is more humane, which is safe for everybody. And RF-free is not only used in our own business, it's used in many other aspects of the business as well. So now, what you need to do is, you can get all these uh, patents for free, only and only you can commit to whatever you put on top of that, share with the same ecosystem. So similar that, to the open source licensing models. Then. Exactly, so that's, that's one of the things that Quartza does, and I think that this is, we're learning in this, this is just one example, but we think that this is the correct way of approaching uh, to the new era. So one of the areas that they wanted us to talk about in the panel, which is very applicable to all of you in the audience, because so many of you are young, so many of you want to start companies, and fourth industrial age is actually a fantastic place to think about companies, even if you're not an engineer. If you have an idea, you can often find an engineer, or you can find an engineer with an idea. Um, so I wanted to ask the panel where they see the most opportunities for young people or young entrepreneurs or even intrapreneurs inside of companies to, to make an impact, something actionable or an area that they find intriguing. So how many of you remember, with a show of hands, when you were kids and you were told to draw a picture and you just drew whatever you imagined? Just with a show of hands. How many of you remember that time? 
higher, a little higher. Don't be shy. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. Good. So I have a little girl, and I watch her imagine the world. And I never say to her, no, but the rocket ship has like two things here. And like, you're forgetting your windows. If she doesn't want a house with windows, I don't care. And I think this is, this is the moment in time where we're at. And this is the exciting thing. And I actually think everybody can participate in this. And they should. Um, so you have the benefit of age and you have the benefit of youth combined, whether it's young people or you're not five anymore and you're still 20 or inside, you know, you can be 60, 70, 80, 90. I don't care. I've met amazingly creative hundred year olds, you know, who have a youthfulness and a willingness to be fearlessly curious. And I think that's essential whether you're inside an organization, whether it's your own company, whether you're in government, whether you're a consumer, I don't care. You're all breathing. Your minds work. Be fearlessly curious. Ask questions about everything. You put on your shoes today. What are they made out of? Are they comfortable? When you walk for an hour, do you still like them? Would you like them to be a little bit different? Cool. Start there. Like, it doesn't matter. It's the things that you care about the most. Imagine it differently. But don't forget, and I think this is the core thing, and, you know, I would talk for hours with anyone that dare stand me, but the core thing is that you have the benefit of age. You're not like my little girl. She doesn't know the world and the rules and the structures. She's in her most selfish stage in life. Everything is just what she wants, where she wants. It's just yes. Why are you saying no, mom? Just say yes. But you know better. So when you get in a car and you drive a car, when you take a bus and you watch the bus, there's rules. There's lines on the road, right? They're there for a reason. They're there to protect other people from accidents or from whatever. When you're imagining your solutions, think through everything. You can be fearlessly curious. That's not the same as making a decision. It's, it's testing out the limits. And I think that's critical at this phase where we're at in innovation now. So you can be anybody. You can be fearlessly curious. You can imagine the moon and back and past. But then go back to now what will it do to me, my family, my friends, my society? Do I really want this change? Is that a responsible thing to do? Should I talk to other people and get guidance? What's what's happening? So keep going with the curiosity. Don't limit yourself. Anybody can do this in any organization. Ask the questions and then ask more questions and then keep asking questions and consider what you might innovate would actually do. I think that's my core piece of advice. Um, but I actually think anybody can can do anything, really. Just be, be mindful. I, I want to separate this into two pieces. One is like a personal advice. Uh, there's a lot to be said about the future of the world, but there are some certain things, and I will try to base my recommendations on it, and I'll try to keep it simple. One thing is um, the training or the formal training or education you will get will not be, how can I say, will not take you until retirement. So instead of a profession or a subject, I would recommend you to learn to learn, mm -hmm. because you will need to keep on learning you through your entire career. That's one thing. The second one thing is the second thing is very important is learn to collaborate. The education system forces most of us to be independent and uh, doesn't necessarily uh, highlight teamwork, but to be successful in the future, multidisciplinary efforts will be much more important. You cannot be a doctor and an engineer and a psychologist at the same time, but to be really able to understand the consumer expectations. Sometimes you need to sit together with a lot of people that you never share anything in common. I'll give you, there's a very nice example about Apple. When you use the iPhone, the, I don't want to maybe uh, highlight a, a brand too much, but when you press that button, everybody gets a sense of an actual physical click of a button. The, the, the sh change of the shade, the time that voice comes, the tick sound that comes from the iPhone, that is engineered to perfection. And the reason for that is that there are five multidisciplinary teams that worked on it. One, a computer engineer, a graphic designer, a, a brain engineer, brain scientist, to really understand how the perception of uh, sound and colors impact your 
uh, understanding and a calligraph. So you know, uh, you will need to work with such teams to be really able to bring stellar products or services. That's one thing. The, on the area, I think uh, what is important is in the future, uh, the new business ideas will come about this intermediation. Mr. Kant mentioned about in the past you waited a long time between the value chains, but more and more you'll see the companies that they or the institutions or the business models that has this whole job of intermediation. What it means is you are taking something from someone and delivering to someone else without really doing much in between. And you are here because you establish a network or investment in the past will no longer be successful. Uh, you will see this with blockchain type of technologies. You will see with direct to consumer type of business models. But any business that relies on intermediation, that will, they will cease to exist. So there are a lot of opportunities in, uh, for entrepreneurs to really look at as business value chain and identify those intermediaries that can be disrupted. So my view is that uh, the biggest uh, disruption the world is waiting for are in areas of education, the quality of learning. Much like we track Uber on longitudinal and latitudinal basis every single taxi, how do we track every single student on the quality of learning that he's getting and the outcome of education of that particular child? The biggest disruption the world is waiting for is in the area of health. And the biggest disruption the world is waiting for is in the area of enhancing production productivity and improving the quality of earnings of farmers in the field of agriculture. And there, if you are able to disrupt, you are not disrupting your own country. It's not your domestic market but you are actually reaching out to the seven billion people of the world, your market. Your market will be the seven billion people of the world who will move from poverty to middle class in the next decade. So just forget America, forget the United States of America. Don't look at the Western world. Look at the seven billion people of the world which will be your market. And to my mind, these are areas of disruption which the world is waiting for. And these are large disruptions. They will provide you the huge business opportunity which the world is waiting for. But whatever you do, whatever you do in the midst of this fourth industrial revolution, do maintain a work-life balance. And that is critical. Because the recent study of United States of America shows that these people look at their mobile 220 times a day. You know, they check their mobile 60 times a day. And you know, even in India, a recent study shows that an individual is getting back to his mobile close to about 38 times a day. So, I mean, that is going to impact your work-life balance. Do disrupt the world, but ensure that you have a work-life balance, and that is critical as you advance forward. And I'd add one thing to what you're saying there. I think one of the more interesting areas around fourth industrial age outside of U.S., is that increasingly you will be able to bring it back into Western markets. So an example is Zipline, the drone company, which makes the world's fastest drones and is doing medical deliveries in, uh, in Africa, and they're actually going to trial it in the U.S. because we have the same problem with uh, getting medicines and blood supplies quickly in areas outside of cities. Uh, so Murat, I'm curious as to where you see opportunities are because you, you know, you're down in the trenches at a, a smallish company working in this area right now. Well, again, uh, this geography, in this geography, what we don't do uh, mostly is um, we don't dare to ask. Okay, we, we are not. When we say, for example, Tanya was saying, let me see a show of hands, the question was simple, and we don't raise our, we, this, we are shy, okay? In, somehow, uh, this part of this world is much more shyer than the Western world, okay? According to our Western world. So in that respect, what I would recommend all young entrepreneurs, all students that are here, and for the rest, I'm really sorry, uh, that please <laughs> do dare to ask, dare to question. 
That's very important. And please do care to ask. Because if you don't ask, and if you don't question, and if you don't speak, there's never going to be growth, prosperity coming out from these, um, let's say, geographies. And we need that. The world needs that. All right? This is the first important uh, personal message that I would like to convey. And secondly, how we can support that, as with uh, Kortza, is that we are somehow related into Industry 4.0, making uh, composite materials, making reinforcement materials, trying to get ourselves into our reinforcers of the world. So what we did for today, as Kort says, we got call to action at Kortza.com, a website, all right? Uh, I'm sorry, an email address that we have for today is that, look, we have university students, we have PhD students, professors, we have labs, and we have part-making capabilities. Just come and join us, write us about what you think, and uh, how we can prosper, how we can create an idea, and let us try to um, envisage this world uh, together. It's very important that it's not only the students, it's not only the entrepreneurs, but everybody within our ecosystem uh, really participates and shares. With that sharing comes, I'm sure that there's going to be certain ideas that are going to flourish and come to uh, really embodiment, and there's going to be value created in that. If we don't do that, it's never going to happen. So please, please, dare to ask, question, and speak, and care to ask, question, and speak. So I think we have about 10 minutes left, is that correct, roughly? Um, I wanted to actually open up the floor for questions because, uh, frankly, you have sitting in front of you some people with a lot of really interesting experience, and I'm sure all of you have some questions. So. Um, Let's go ahead and, uh, you know, if you have a question, raise your hand. I don't know if we have mics or we're not doing that or you just speak up. It's a small room. Uh, I'm not sure what we need. Uh, okay, you're going to bring that? Sure. So, and if you, please, as Murad is saying, raise your hand, ask a question, ask something interesting. You know, we'd like to hear. Barış uh, Ergen from Sabah newspaper, a Turkish daily newspaper. Um, I would like to ask uh, about uh, Industry 4.0 or this digitalization feature because uh, we are writing f uh, for four years uh, about Industry 4.0, but uh, we, we, uh, we wrote many good articles about it, but we, we see now uh, some failures in uh, digitalization uh, these days. Uh, uh, GE is an example for that. There are many articles about GE's failure of digital uh, transformation. Uh, is this uh, a risk for uh, companies uh, also? Because uh, you can fail in uh, this uh, transformation process. Uh, how do you see this? Uh, because we are always talking about the benefits of uh, Industry 4.0. Ms. Boots or Mr. Pazar can uh, uh, answer this question. Thank you. I'm happy to do a light touch to it and then we can add, yeah. Um, so here's the thing. Do we ever really fail? Um, and I think it's a mindset and so I'm not being, you know, trite when I say that. But think about it. I set a goal for myself to achieve X. Elon Musk to the moon, right? Jeff Bezos, we've got all kinds of outstanding life, not on Earth. but we're going to fail. Like, we're setting audacious goals. We will fail on those audacious goals for now. But it's everything we learn along the way that gets us closer and closer and closer. And we correct, and we get back on course, and we go. And slowly, we get to the moon. But I, I think there's a level of expectations that have to be set early. It's very, very, very soon. We are, we are at the beginning, 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 right? So what we def decide is success today, if we're thinking short term always, so what then? Like this is about thinking way further than that. It's about failing and learning from what we failed and then we haven't failed. You can just move it. We didn't fail, we learned. 
And as long as we apply the lessons we learn and we keep improving, then we're innovating, right? So I think it's just a shift. That's my, my overall perspective for any company, any government, any organization that's engaging in innovation in this space right now. Um, but you can give more specifics. I mean, the, the terms Industry 4.0, uh, Fourth Industry Revolution and Digital Transformation are sometimes used interchangeably, but just to uh, give you my perspective, Industry 4.0 is a term coined by the Germans. And the main reason for that is to continue their competitive advantage in manufacturing, uh, especially against some rising other countries that have started to dominate in, uh, the infra in the international markets, let's say. However, China embraced Germany's move and uh, were in World Economic Forum last year, they said we'll be the champions of the fourth industrial revolution. So, you know, th there's an economic battle in terms of uh, manufacturing jobs and manufacturing competitiveness, but putting that aside, a company's effort to launch a new product might fail. Before Facebook, there were so many social media companies that failed, and I don't I want to call GE a, a failure, rather maybe you know, uh, a management change and, and a strategic direction change. Uh, having said that, it's not tied to one company. What is real is, there are fundamental companies and technologies that are changing the world. Even if they are not really succeeding in what they are supposed to succeed at, they are actually catalyzing entire industries. Tesla is a good example. Tesla maybe is not a financial success yet, but they are keeping every other car manufacturer on their toes. And every other car manufacturer now has a very strong electric vehicle uh, Roadmaps, thanks to Tesla. Without Tesla, maybe everybody would hold on to their diesel or gasoline engines for the next decade. So, you know, from a broader perspective, I think the change is real and the pace of change is accelerating. And this is a fact, and this cannot be, in a way, uh, disputed, in my uh, personal opinion. Uh, just to crystallize this, when IKEA was launched, how long did it take to impact the economy in Turkey? four decades, maybe 40 years, 50 years. How long did it take for that to happen for Uber? Mm -hmm. There was protests in Turkey for Uber. Why? Because it impacted in like a couple of years. Uh, but it took four decades for IKEA to do the same impact. So it's global economy and disruption. That's, I think that's real. And we have to be serious about it. So we have a bunch more questions. So let's go ahead and, because uh, I think we only have four or five more minutes. Yeah. Oh, we're, we're okay, so we're already done. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, well, I think you, you have the names of the people on the stage. I'm sure all of them are open to questions. Um, I certainly am as well. Uh, and any feedback that you can give to GEC on the panel, thank you very much. And thank you for attending. And we hope you launch a business in this space. <laughs>